Today we are obviously here to talk about the AISC seismic provisions. And in the, these are provisions that are in addition to the specification for structural steel buildings. These are special provisions for uh, seismic, where seismic uh, ductility and, and seismic resistance is required. And basically what these provisions do is attempt to at least provide a system ductility. One way to define system ductility uh, is the ability of the system to maintain stability after yielding and overloading of some elements. The yielding of the elements will obviously give you uh, the ability to deform, increase the deformations uh, without a large increase in the, the shear strength, or excuse me, the shear being experienced by the building. And the ductility can sort of be measured by the area under that, that curve or the ability to deform, uh, have significant deformations while remaining stable. And if we look at you know, what certain aspects of that could be is the ability of the yielding or overloaded elements to deform and have stable deformation. The ability of the elements that don't yield to withstand the forces that are caused by the yielding of those other elements and by the fact that forces will redistribute and when you're going into an inelastic response of a structure, the force distribution can be very different from an elastic distribution. And also the ability of the non-yielding elements to withstand the deformations uh, that are caused by the yielding of the structure. So it's not just the forces, it's also the deformations that go along with the ductility requirements. In order to provide system ductility, the seismic provision uses uh, basically four measures. And I've kind of grouped these into these four items uh, just to, as a way to think about what the provisions are attempting to do. So for each seismic force resisting system, you first identify the tiger yield mechanism of the system. How, do you, how are you, is the frame expected to behave? You designate deformation controlled elements within that system and then design the remaining elements as force controlled members and you go ahead and uh, also protect critical locations in the system. And we'll look at a little bit more of each of these four points on the next slides. So the first step is to identify the target yield mechanism of the system. And for example, you'll get flexural yield in the beams of a moment frame just outside of the connection. You can get tension yield and compression buckling in a concentrically braced frame, or you get shear yield or a combination of shear and flexural yield in the links in an eccentrically braced frame. The second step is to uh, designate the deformation controlled elements. And once you identify those elements, to design those elements for element ductility so that they will have a stable yield as the structure or the frames deform and as an example here we show the requirements for the moment curvature uh, the moment and angle relationship at the beam to column connections for moment frames and those ductility requirements are often uh, prescriptive or require testing or pre-qualification like this uh, connections for special and intermediate moment frames Next, we would design the remaining elements as force controlled. So you design these elements to remain more or less elastic at the capacity of the ductile elements. So you determine what force, forces are in these so-called elastic members when the deformation controlled members reach their yielding strength and you design these members to resist those forces. Again, the one of the key things to think about here is this is a capacity analysis in a lot of situations and the distribution of forces in the inelastic state can be very different from those that uh, come from an elastic analysis. The other thing that you need to do for the uh, force controlled elements is to design to make sure that the deformations caused by the yielding uh, of the deformation controlled elements can be accommodated. For example, if you're expect <clears throat> excuse me, if you're expecting the compression braces to buckle, the connection details either need to be strong enough to uh, allow the 
buckling to occur in the brace and not the connection, or have the correct flexibility to allow or the correct restraints or release of restraints to allow that brace to buckle freely.